Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, depending on what part of the world you're in. And welcome to APQC's March KM webinar, which is on making your KM strategy a reality. Here at APQC, we talk a lot about how to nail down the business case for knowledge management, how to um, figure out what your critical knowledge is, uh, what problems you want to solve. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today, but we're really going to focus on once you've got all of that down, what you do next. So how do you successfully move from planning to doing? That's going to be our, our real focus today. So before we get started, I do have a, just a couple of process notes I wanted to share. You will all be in um, on mute, audio only for the call, but we do want your questions, your comments, your feedback, all of those sorts of things. There are a couple of different ways that you can share those. You can type them in the Q&A panel to the right of your screen, or at the end of the call, you can also use the raise your hand feature. There's a little picture of a hand. You can click that and it'll light up and that will let us know that you have a question that you want to ask live. And we'll take questions at the end, but if you guys are typing questions in the Q&A panel, we'll also try to, to deal with a few of those as we go along today. And then um, you will get a copy of the slides and recording in an email in a few days in case you want to share it with somebody else or if you have to leave for any reason. So my name is Lauren Trees. For those of you who don't know me, I lead the Knowledge Management Research Program here at APQC. And I've invited Darcy Lemons, who's one of our senior advisors at APQC, to sit in with me on this webinar because Darcy has lots of experience launching KM programs, intervening to help struggling KM pro programs start delivering more value. Um, and, and I think she'll have great insights and be a great person to help answer your questions. So thanks for being here, Darcy. Absolutely. I'm happy to join you today, Lauren. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. So um, I am glad to share my experiences as we're um, while we're with the group today. Excellent. So for our purposes today, I want to think about an organization's KM business case and strategy, all of that planning that you do, like the blueprint for a construction project. So, so putting that blueprint together is challenging in its own right. First of all, you've got to design the right thing. If somebody comes to you and says that they want a four bedroom house and you build a really cool loft studio with a balcony on your plan, uh, then that's probably not going to meet the need. And then you also need to design a structure that's going to stand up. Uh, you may have the right general idea, but you know, you're, you're missing some foundational engineering there. And it's kind of the same thing with a KM business case and strategy. You need the vision to design the right thing that, that solves the organization's most urgent knowledge problems. And you need to design it in a way that makes sense for the landscape, the target audience, the organizational culture, all those circumstances that you have to build around. But even if you have that great blueprint, that is no guarantee that things will go smoothly once you start building. And if you've ever uh, done an addition on your house or any kind of construction project, you know that. Um, so you may not get the materials you expect, the plumber may not show up for two weeks, the client may change their mind halfway through and decide they want something else entirely. So, so it takes a special kind of, um, of skills and know-how to make things move forward efficiently in that construction process. So today, Darcy and I really want to focus on some, some webinars for that KM construction. So how do you quickly get your strategy off paper so you can start fixing problems and delivering value to the business in a meaningful way? Because building a KM program is harder than it looks. And, and even if you have a great vision, a great plan, you may realize along the way that the plan needs adjusting or you may be missing some critical pieces. So our goal today is to help you actualize that KM vision and strategy. And it may be your first KM strategy, or it may be just the most recent iteration of that strategy. But, but to, before we get too far into this, we thought it would be a good idea to ask you um, 
where you are on your KM journey and, and, and where you are vis-a-vis -vis this uh, kind of program development. So we've got a little poll for you. You guys should see it up on the screen and hopefully it'll pop up for you guys to, uh, to answer in a minute. Um, we really just want to know, are you thinking and planning about KM? Are you in the process of developing that strategy? Are you piloting, starting some things? Maybe you're building, scaling from there, or is your KM program pretty mature and you're in more of a sustain and evolve mode? So Darcy, we were kind of putting this question together and you know, you kind of have to come up with some bulleted answer choices, but this isn't always a, a linear progression, right? It's cyclical, you may go up or down around over time. Absolutely, up, down, around, sideways. <laughs> All of that can happen. I mean, there's just, there's so many different forces that can impact your plans, um, whether, whether you're at that thinking and planning stage, or even in all the way in mature and sustaining. I mean, there's internal forces like reorganizations, mergers and acquisitions, um, you know, uh, and, and even more tactical than that, you know, you're, you're, you have a KM sponsor and maybe they accept a different role in the organization and they transfer. Now you got to pause and find a new KM sponsor um, uh, so that you can continue with the work um, and continue with that, that leadership support. Um, you may not have all the budget that you want. Uh, you may determine that you need um, some additional help, some additional people resources um, uh, to be boots on the ground for you. Um, you know, th these are all internal forces that can, can impact, but there's also external, right? I mean, market forces that can impact the strategy of the organization. And heck, look what we went through over the past year. You know, pandemics forced every organization, small, medium, large, to rethink their strategies and what was important and, and where they were going to um, allocate their resources um, during, the, during this past year. So sometimes, sometimes you can predict and plan uh, and, and um, you know, kind of buffer yourself against those changes and, and sometimes they really do come out of the blue. And it's interesting, when we look at the poll results, it seems like pretty evenly distributed across those five, you know, five groups. Yep. So a little bit more in the building and scaling mode, a few less in the piloting and just starting out mode, but a, a pretty even split on the call. So hopefully there'll be something interesting for all of you. Everyone. So I am... Um, to achieve our, our goals on today's call, uh, we're really going to focus on three case studies. Uh, Prudential Financial, which sells insurance, investment management, other financial services. Swagelock, which is a fluid systems manufacturer. And U.S. Pharmacopeia, which is a nonprofit that develops standards for quality and safety of medications. So three very different organizations, but we noticed last year as we were examining their KM programs, all three had really excelled at this issue that we're talking about today, moving from strategy to execution so that KM quickly stopped being an idea or a blueprint and started doing things and, and delivering tangible value to the business. So we saw that common thread through all these stories and we thought that it would be really nice to put them together and, uh, and combine the themes. So based on that and, and also everything that, that Darcy and I and APQC knows about um, you know, building KM programs, we've outlined some recommendations for getting a new or revitalized KM program off the ground. And that's really what we're gonna talk about today. I think you can look at this next slide that I've got up here as our agenda slide for the call. This is really where we're gonna spend the remainder of our time. We have 10 recommendations in total, but we've divided them into four categories. The first is around priorities. On your long KM to-do list, what are you gonna tackle first? How do you pick the right pilot projects to pursue? How, how do you make sure that you are um, doing the right thing in the right order? The second is around resources. And when I say resources here, I'm primarily focused on people resources. So, so how do you get the right people in the right seats on the bus doing the right things to support knowledge management? And that includes the central team, any uh, KM embedded roles you had out in the business, as well as partners and rank and file employees who are utilizing KM services. 
The third category is around engagement, how you market and sell KM to participants and proactively manage change. And then the final category I'm calling progression. So once you get things moving, things are happening, how do you analyze those initial activities and projects, capitalize on what's working, maybe fix or tweak things that aren't working so that you make sure that, that you keep uh, building momentum in the right direction as you get more and more into that building and scaling mode that I think 27% of you said that you were in. Um, and, and I think that regardless of where you are on your KM journey, there's going to be pieces of this that you can pull in and help you um, to evolve what you're doing and, and move to the next level. So our first category here is priorities. And some of you may be scratching your heads at me and saying, well, you know, Lauren, if I've done a good job of strategic planning for knowledge management and I've got a good blueprint, shouldn't I already know what my priorities are? And yes, there is some overlap here in terms of finalizing your strategy and starting that execution mode. But what we find is that many strategies have a laundry list of goals that aren't prioritized, or they set really high level goals without articulating the specific path to get there. Or even if the strategy does have priorities and specifics, the CAM team may need to do some tweaking on that as the rubber hits the road. Um, I was saying to Darcy that no plan uh, survives first contact with the enemy yesterday. And I think that that's true of, of your CAM strategy as well. So it's important to be open-minded, to be willing to clarify, refine your strategy as you start to roll out KM tools and approaches. And also to what Darcy was just saying, uh, we've all seen in the last year, priorities can change pretty fast. So you might think in January that you're gonna pilot something and then in March, something else becomes more important and you need to be ready to reshuffle that deck and, and keep aligned with the business. That's always critical. So one of the most common mistakes that we see KM teams do is jumping into solutions uh, without doing enough uh, thorough objective investigation of the current state and, and what's really going on. You may think that you know what the problems are, you're really excited to go start fixing them, but we really do recommend that you take that step back, do your due diligence, collect the data to understand that current state. And I think of current state in two categories. Uh, the first is really that needs assessment. So what problems and opportunities does the business want KM to solve? Um, and, and when I say the business, we're talking all kinds of different stakeholders from your senior leaders to your frontline managers to maybe your new hires, more junior employees, they're all gonna have different perspectives. Um, you know, because you can talk to leaders and they may think they you should go in a particular direction, um, but there may be some end user pain points that they're less aware of that are nonetheless big problems, uh, you know, and causing problems for the business as a whole. And then you also want to evaluate how knowledge currently flows. Maybe you have, um, you know, some localized KM or an older KM program that's lagging that you want to revitalize, or, or maybe you don't have any kind of formal knowledge management at all. But regardless of that, um, people still have ways to store and gather and share knowledge. And, and it might be completely formal, informal, and maybe you know just within a particular team or business group. But you'll you'll want to figure out what those systems and informal processes are, and, and if there are anything that you can build on. Darcy, is there anything that you would add here, based on your experience uh, doing this out out in the field with uh, with organizations? You know, a couple of things occur to me, Lauren, and one of them is. Uh, is, is the culture of the organization and truly understanding that, um, you know, and some of us have been working in our organizations for a long time. We've, we've got that, uh, you know, we, we, or we believe we have a pretty firm grasp on it. Um, you know, but sometimes you're coming into an organization, you know, new, fresh, uh, fresh, freshly hired, or, you know, maybe you've only been there for a few months. And so the, the you know, the culture may, may not be, you may not be fully aware of all the nuances of it. And, just as you're having these conversations and understanding the needs of the target audience and thinking and learning about how um, knowledge, you know, how their knowledge flows and, and, and their preferences, you know. So as, as, as you're listening to all of that, listen for behavioral cues as well. And, you know, the, the kinds of things that 
that may crop up and 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 some that can be very obvious you know oh you know the the, the classic you know we don't have time everybody's super busy um I, somebody told me last year i was working with a, a team and uh, we were we were doing some we were talking to members of our target audience right a bunch of different interviews and somebody kept saying you know well my entire group is operating at 140 percent capacity and i'm i was i mean i know my eyes opened really wide and i didn't say it you know but my thought was um you know are your processes working effectively what's going on that's you know is are you really just is it that time of year like you know they weren't they're not accountants so it wasn't you know that the um tax refunds were due or anything like that so it was like what is causing you to be at 140 percent capacity and do i need to know that as a km practitioner who's building a strategy because there's something i might need to account for in my strategy so listening for some of those cues those behavioral cues and and um that that you'll you'll hear um through those discussions and then the other part of it is just is having that um, kind of greater situational awareness of what's going on in the organization. If your firm has um, just announced or uh, um, you know that they're doing three big strategic initiatives that year, or maybe they they're you're in the midst. There's three of them that have already been launched, and they're you know six months in or a year into them or something like that. You know where does KM play in that? What is the connection? Um, uh, or is there a connection? How can KM um, support or enable any of those initiatives? Um, or if, if KM is one of them, um, you know, then understanding what is the, um, is who among our target audience might also be involved in those initiatives and what kind of bandwidth is that taking from them? Uh, so, because you may find that if they're completely focused on one of those big initiatives, they may not have the time uh, for uh, or to, to pilot, um, uh, you know, some a new KM uh, approach or a new knowledge flow process or something like that. And so we've got to find that that balance um, um, in our organization with what what understanding the culture and and the behaviors that we want to um, to encourage, and then also that situational awareness of what is really going on, what is the reality of our situation at this point in time, and 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 finding the right timing for this. I think that's a really good point and hitching yourself to any big strategic initiative or business goal or you know 2030 vision or something like that and, and talking really clearly about how what you're doing fits into that broader structure can really help. Absolutely and we'll actually touch on that a little bit later in our talk today. So of our three case studies, I thought that U.S. Pharmacopoeia would be a great example to throw in here because they've really both invested in and, and benefited from that clear-eyed assessment of needs and current practices that we're talking about. When they decided to formalize KM and take it to the next level, they started by doing an inventory of all their existing KM tools and approaches and surveyed employees about, first of all, how satisfied were they with what was out there, you know, different collaboration tools, repositories, and things like that, and also how hard it was to find information. And at the same time, they hosted workshops and open houses and had conversations uh, to capture some more detailed qualitative feedback on what was really going on. And they also benchmarked with APQC's KM capability assessment tool to get that outsider view of KM capabilities that were in place and, and maybe what their biggest gaps were, even when they're kind of at that starting stage. So they wanted to understand what their users needed. Um, you know, they also wanted to know what was already going on inside the organization that could be formalized or replicated or, or built upon in some way. So Darcy, I know you spend a lot of time with the capability assessment tool, and I wanted to ask you how you see that kind of assessment fitting into a current state analysis that includes the user needs and the culture and all those other pieces we've been talking about. Yeah, you know, Lauren, it, for me, it's it's one more tool in the toolbox. So um, a KM team can, can complete the assessment and um, using the results of it then can um, uh, kind of, uh, uh, triangulate or um, calibrate, that's the word I was looking for, calibrate, what are they hearing from those stakeholders that they've been talking to? Um, you know, everyone from their end users um, on up to uh, their business leaders. And uh, what, what it really helps I do, I believe, is 
So, you know, um, and, and you know this, Lauren, that the, the assessment itself um, addresses KM cap 12 different KM capabilities. And this is everything from objectives and business case to people resources and change management to um, our KM approaches to our um, IT and content management capabilities in our organizations. And what I, what, what I really see the um, uh, teams doing when they get the results of this is they, they um, have analyzed the data that they collected through these discussions that they had, maybe some surveys that they've conducted, and then they can look at the um, assessment results and see where there's overlap or synergy um, uh, between those. Because if they're hearing from people that um, you know, some of the issues are around finding and accessing the knowledge um, and that they're like, we know it's out there, you know, um, we've got like many, so many organizations, all these documents, and, but they're, and, and, and different types of files, but they're scattered all over the place. And so then looking at the, um, you know, the IT and content management capabilities in the organization, you know, what is the maturity level of those? And if that's low, then you know, and we're hearing people saying that they're having trouble finding and accessing. So you're validating what you've learned there. And then you can use the, um, uh, the, that analysis to, to help pinpoint what needs to be a part of our KM strategy and our KM roadmap. You know, what do we need to focus on? And it can help you prioritize where to focus, what can sometimes be some limited people and monetary resources um, and, and, and help inform where to allocate those to support pilots and other activities. That's one of the biggest problems is organizations trying to boil the ocean. And I think sometimes you can get overwhelmed with the current state analysis if everything's broken and everybody has a hair on fire problem and maybe they're different for different groups. And so I, th I think the assessment can help you just take it down one level and figure out what are the foundational capabilities that we really need to build and the problems that we need to solve first. Absolutely. So I think that our U.S. Pharmacopeia example flows beautifully into our next recommendation, which is to build on existing foundations and workflows within the organization. If you do that current state assessment right, you'll often find some potential, some raw materials that you can work with. And that's exactly what happened at U.S. Pharmacopeia. As they started talking to people about different KM tools and resources that were out there that were valuable, um, in the United States, they found out that the old KM program that had existed before offered an informal Ask the Expert service where staff could call the KM office and get the name of a relevant subject matter expert for a particular question or project. And people really liked that service, but it was very manual and ad hoc and wasn't something that could be scaled without technology. And then across the world at USP's India site, they had done a skill mapping exercise to identify all the different people at the site who could operate certain equipment. And this was a big immediate win for the site. It was a pretty simple project. It delivered immediate value, especially when COVID-19 hit. They knew exactly who could operate which machines. And KM was able to learn from both of these localized projects to design a more formal talent seeker um, tool, uh, which it then piloted in the India office. And, and it did the same for its other pilots as well. Um, parts of the organization were, for example, using Box and liked it. So they built a pilot on how to share scientific materials through Box. So just lo looking for those tools that maybe the organization already has um, or processes that some people have liked, because that can give you not only some ideas for what to pilot, but a group that maybe has some enthusiasm to help you pilot that in a limited capacity. So the, the final recommendation in this section is really about focusing on the most urgent challenges and opportunities, which is really what we've been dancing around this whole time. And this may seem obvious, but I think it's important to call out, um, you know, especially because those challenges and opportunities, as we said, are always shifting. So you may be ready to launch your pilot, try something new, and that's the moment to look around and see if there's a burning platform that you can latch onto, even if it's not what you planned six months ago. 
And this particular example is from SwageLog. And SwageLog's KM effort has always emphasized communities of practice, but they initially struggled. They weren't getting quite as much traction as they wanted. But that really changed when the KM team identified the right problem to solve. They realized that their IT team was really struggling to implement SAP Business One, kind of business, global business system, um, in their sales and service centers. So KM partnered with IT to build a community around the SAP implementation. Um, it gave each center access to centralized relevant content when they got to implementing, and, and also lessons learned from previous previous centers that had gone through the implementation. And KM really threw everything at this project. They leveraged everything they knew about good community management, like setting KPIs for the community, having a dedicated community leader, mapping the critical knowledge associated with the community topic. But all of it worked better. It was more effective because they had found that, that urgent need within the business. Um, you know, so the CAM team, they kind of took a risk. They put a lot of other things on hold to build this community, but it really paid off in terms of showing what KM could do and how it could help the business. So Darcy, I just wanted to ask your input on this. I know you've done some work with SwageLock over the mm -hmm. years. Absolutely. In fact, um, we were working with them a few years ago, right, I think it was right before this whole the SAP implementation and, and helping them formulate their strategy um, and and which was very focused, as you mentioned, on communities of practice, which they had already had in place before we came in and uh, to work with them. But we 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 helped them with some tools and templates and 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 discussions and and really um, to, to to focus uh, their efforts and um, begin to put in some uh, improvements to strengthen their communities of practice. And this implementation was happening or started soon after. Um, and as you said, it, it became something that was um, you know, uh, very important to the organization and something that the KM team could then partner with others. Um, and they said, you know what, we've got these things called communities that can help um, with um, identifying the critical knowledge associated with this implementation and, and getting it um, uh, to the right people um, to help not only with support the implementation, but then the end users and what they needed to be doing afterwards. So, um, you know, I would just say, uh, and, and again, this harkens back to a few minutes ago when we were talking about you know the situational awareness and what's going on in the organization you know um, if there's something going on um, you know a, a, a digital transformation um, initiative perhaps uh, some type of um, uh, continuous improvement effort um, uh, any number of different things in your organization that you know km can have a role and play and say hey we can help you we can map the knowledge that's needed for this we can help like, prioritize what's um, uh, critical there and um, you know uh, get the end users involved um, to really help things run a little bit more smoothly um, through uh, through that implementation so you know what we've seen is that when when um, KM teams and organizations are able to take advantage that way and get involved you know that basically it, it, it helps shine that spotlight on knowledge management it can um, uh, uh, from a, in a positive perspective you know it can get you extra resources um, it, and money monetarily and um, people wise um, it gets leadership involved in understanding from um, uh, really what knowledge management is all about it might have been kind of this vague thing that they sort of knew oh yeah you know getting the right knowledge to the right people at the right time but now they're seeing it in action and so it becomes much more clear to them um, and and you find also that people are a lot more willing to be involved because this is something this whatever this initiative is it's something that's impacting their jobs and so they find themselves very interested in anything that can help them um, improve in their jobs um, and and do things more effectively and efficiently so you know, look for those opportunities and, and, and that's whether you're starting out um, uh, you know blank slate with knowledge management in your organization, or you've been doing this for um, years now, I'm probably not telling you anything you don't already know for those who've been, have mature programs, but, you know, latching onto those initiatives and supporting them um, uh, has, can have very, very positive uh, uh, impact for your organ, for your team uh, program. Yeah, we talk about business alignment a lot, which may sound kind of more buzzwordy, but that's what we're talking about is yeah. find a thing that people really want to do and yeah. help them. 
Yes, and you may uncover it through those conversations, you know, that the, the, that awareness that we were talking about earlier. So it may surface through that. It may surface through some type of town hall, all staff type meeting. Your you never know where these inputs are going to come from, but just jump on them and take advantage um, when you can. Yeah, because it's a timing issue too. It may not come Absolutely. up the minute you're doing your current state assessment, but you've got to keep your your ear to the ground, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think that moves us very nicely into our talk conversation on resources. And, and as I said, we're going to focus more on people than money. So obviously money is often a barrier to getting the people you need. <laughs> so it's all tied up together a little bit. Our first recommendation here is to put dedicated resources in place to drive KM forward. And this might not this might seem like a no-brainer, and, and I know that if you don't have budget, if you don't have leadership support, it's a it's a tough challenge. But we call it out because you you really will not actualize your KM strategy without people, you know, some kind of KM team to, to move it forward. You know, when we talk to an organization that's taken two years to design their KM strategy, and then they're going to spend another two years to do their first pilot, and you're kind of wondering why things are moving so slowly, and then you realize two people have this on top of their regular jobs, and they're doing it on, you know, Tuesday afternoons from three to five. That, that's usually why, um, you know, so... You need some at least one person and, and often more, you know, in that kind of central KM role. And you probably need some designated KM roles out in the business to do some of the work that that core team can't. So if we look at our three case studies, all, all of them emphasized dedicated resources when they talked to us, both on that central team and as part of the business. Prudential has a central team, but they also have trained KM content authors out in the business with really clear expectations. U.S. Pharmacopeia has a director of knowledge strategy role, but also a KM champion program out in the business. Swagelock has you know, a central team, but they've really fought to get those dedicated community leaders that are, are separate from the community subject matter experts who are really responsible for facilitating community activities. They're community experts rather than topic experts and, and have the time to make that community work. So Darcy, I know this issue of resources is tricky for so many programs. Do you have any advice for how people can fight for resources, fight for more resources if they just don't, they're not getting support, they have a little bit of pushback there? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it, it really comes down to the business case and the, 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 the rationale for it. And you've got to have a, a, a really crisp, clear uh, a business case that, you know, states the, the, the benefits um, of, of having these additional resources and in, in, and in real, you know, crisp language that's, uh, 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 that talks to whoever, whichever business leader you're going to and seeking um, these resources from. So, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that um, uh, we've seen is, you know, uh, is that, it, it, like you said, it can be hard if, if especially when you're first starting out um, and you don't have um, uh, maybe some strong um, success stories that you can point to. Um, that can help illustrate the point and and why um, these additional resources are uh, are are being requested. Um, and I would say if you don't have those um, internally, you know, then it's a perfect time to do um, do some benchmarking um, and uh, look at other organizations to see what they have done and how they have um, how they have uh, developed uh, the the team, um, both the KM core team that they have in place, and then those those resources that they might have out in the business, people who are acting as their advocates and representatives um, out in the business. And, and um, you know, certainly, you know, at APQC, we have lots of examples um, uh, um, in our resource library. We also have um, some really good um, benchmarks and metrics um, that are available that can um, you can look at to say, you know, well, here's what the mean is. Um, for you know uh, my industry perhaps or um, just in, in general um, based on the data we've collected and and use that as part of your business case to say you know for uh, uh, organizations with this kind of program that um, meets these kinds of parameters um, you know this is typically what uh, they have in place but you have to be able to justify that with 
your own rationale for why it's needed, what they're going to do, what the benefit will be, um, costs, and, and, and things like that. And if you don't have, um, if you don't have that well thought out and, and even crisply, I would say not even just in your thoughts, get it, get it on, on paper somehow, you know, um, and, and that's, that's going to be uh, one of the biggest success factors for getting those additional resources is you, you really have to, to make that business case for them. And especially in this day and time, you know, coming out of the, well, as we're slowly coming out of the pandemic, but, you know, budgets got, a lot of budgets got slashed really hard this past year. And so it's not going to be a matter of just, oh, we're flicking the switch and everything's coming back on and, and you know, we're going to be uh, immediately start hiring again or anything like that. You know, uh, we're, we're, we're competing for resources um, in our organizations. And so just like um, any other, uh, you know, if, whether you're in the R&D function or in sales and marketing or, or wherever, um, you've got to make the case for hiring or uh, whether that's an internal hire or an external hire. No, I think that's great. And then I think once you have some people who are focused on making KM happen, another way that you can fill some of the gaps in your program, especially if you have a lean team, is through some cross-functional partnerships. And I, I think those partnerships are, are particularly vital when you're in those early stages and, and getting KM off the ground, because you're the new kid on the block and all these other functions are still, they're still trying to decide how they feel about you. So <laughs> you um, you want to build good relationships. You um, you want to get them in on the ground floor, sell them KM as, as something that can help them with their objectives rather than something that's going to uh, take up their time for no reason or maybe compete with their objectives and, and goals. So I, I think first you've got to look at partners with the business, the target user groups for KM, whether that's R&D or customer service or sales and, and really understand that. Um, you know, and at the same time, you, you want to talk to the groups that you're focused on for your pilots, but you also want to be really aware of how not making your solutions hyper customized to those groups because you may want to scale the, beyond that at some point. Um, so, so balancing the very specific needs of, okay, I'm building this for customer service with, well, if I want to bring in other parts of the business, I don't want to make it um, so specific to that group that it doesn't work for others. And then the other side of this is, um, you know, partnering with other enablement functions. Obviously, you want a good relationship with IT. They can support you with technology. There's a lot of overlap with HR and learning on things like skills mapping and succession management. Two partners that we've seen become more important recently are change management. They can really help you just sell yourself, tell your story, drive engagement. And also data management to get that holistic view of data and information and knowledge across the organization to be looking at that as part of a holistic strategy. And they can also help you with metrics and reporting. Um, so I think there's a, a lot of good things going on here. And some organizations do formalize some of these relationships in a cross-functional steering committee. Um, others don't. But Darcy, I, I think you and I both feel like there's a, there's a lot of reason to do that if you can. Absolutely. Um, and, and in fact, that's that's part of our standard advice when we're going in and working with a group, um, especially one that's that's new, um, you know, that we're starting from scratch with with knowledge management or maybe only a few months in. And, uh, we, you know, what what kind of um, steering committee or advisory group ha um, have they formed at that point, if they have? And if not, then, you know, it's, it's time to start the conversations and figure out um, who would be part of that? And you can look at your, you know, those, the, the target audience that you've been talking to already and, you know, understanding um, where uh, or who among that would be uh, appropriate to have in that steering committee. Um, and the reason is because there's, there's so many things that a steering committee can help a core KM team do, right? Um, they can, um, uh, first of all, they can advocate for knowledge management. Um, and for the core team um, in their parts, their respective parts of the organization. Um, they can um, provide advice and guidance um, and, 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 and even um, uh, introduce us to other people, uh, key influencers, subject matter experts, others in our organization that we might not have met yet 
um, uh, that we want to have involved in our pilots and, and other um, efforts and activities that we're supporting in the organization. Uh, they, can, uh, uh, they can also help us uh, when we encounter barriers um, and, and brainstorm and how are we going to address these barriers what makes the most sense in their parts of the organization, because it's not necessarily, a, you know, we all know change management's not a one size fits all type uh, uh, a strategy or, or approach. So what works well with our engineering function might not work so well in customer service, um, but they can help us uh, with those uh, uh, barriers and really to understand what's, what's the driving force behind the barrier and then how are we going to get past it and what is that going to take? Um, you know, and, and and we have, um, uh, Lauren, you know, well, you, you do know, you were part of this uh, research a few years ago that we did um, some research on the data that we collected through the CAME Capability Assessment. And one of the things that we learned through that research was that um, programs with, with active champions and sponsors, um, with those steering committees in place, they're five times more likely to be able to secure the resources uh, that they need, and that might be people resources, it might be monetary, could be technology, um, covers the covers the spectrum there. So um, they they do play a key role, um, and it's important to to um, invite the right people to play and be a part of your uh, be a part of your steering committee. And to that end, I think how how you think about different partners and how you pick different partners. Uh, really comes at it for me in this example from Swagelock and just mm -hmm. how thoughtful and deliberate they were about thinking through the different types of partners they needed and, and what they needed from those groups, um, that they needed relationships with, with senior leaders and strategy leaders in terms of that business alignment. They needed relationships with HR and information services to execute their strategy. And then they needed a whole bunch of different relationships with leaders and, and end users out in the business to drive adoption and then to get continuous feedback on what they were doing so that they could grow and improve. And I think really thinking about the different types of relationships that you need and, and how you're gonna work those um, is, is crucial to successful partnership. And then the last recommendation I wanted to highlight in this section is as mundane as it is important. Uh, as you move from KM strategy to reality, you need to make sure that people out in the business, as well as your partners, uh, people on the core team, understand their role, what they're being asked to do, and when. And, and you're really much more likely to get the outcome that you want if you um, give business groups time to plan for those contributions and are, are really clear about what you want. And this particular example is from Prudential, whose initial KM project revolved around a, a massive content migration to a new system. And they broke that down into phases. They were really clear about what they needed from people at each phase. But they also developed some governance framework rules that outlined expectations and accountability for everyone involved. Um, so, you know, if you're a content reviewer, you're going to follow this process. And if you don't, we're going to archive your content. So it's really that um, relationship and covenant between the core team, the, the roles out in the business, and the end users on who's going to do what to make all of this successful. And, and that's really a crucial part of resourcing your KM program as well. So this next section, engagement, is a natural follow-on because it goes even deeper into this relationship between KM and the business. And I think picks up on some of the threads of what we've been talking about. So many KM programs sputter along without delivering much value because people aren't bought in, they're not participating. And obviously it's a big topic, but there are two specific recommendations from this research that I wanted to highlight here. So the first is around um, needing to be thoughtful about how you message KM and start your marketing, your proactive marketing to your audiences early. 
one consequence of, of not doing this is that we find KM can become a victim of its own success. If it has a pilot or an initial approach that really takes off, that's great. But then people will start to associate KM just with that one thing. So in their mind, KM is the SharePoint repository or KM is the lessons learned system. And they don't really understand the breadth and depth of what KM is about um, you know, beyond that particular piece that they have have used. So we find that it's good to get out in front of this problem early and, and communicate that KM is not just one thing, that it's this ecosystem of, of people, process, and technology, or, or systems and behaviors, as one of our, our case study participants put it. And there are different ways to do this. One that we find particularly effective is through a cohesive KM brand. So this is another example from US Pharmacopeia. And they were really thoughtful in building this brand. They thought that without KM, there was really sort of a knowledge desert uh, in the organization. It was hard to find things, but that there was a lot of potential under the surface. And they wanted KM to be that oasis in the desert where knowledge thrives. So, um, you know, it's a compelling metaphor and imagery. But it was also useful because it branded KM as a single clear idea rather than all these different pilots and different approaches that they were um, experimenting with. And it emphasized this idea of KM as an interconnected system of all pointed towards a, a common goal. And Darcy, you and I have talked a lot about the, the value of, of having a brand. I don't know if you have anything you wanted to add here. Uh, you know, I'd just like to say that um, it, I echo everything um, that that you've said about the importance of of having that brand, Lauren, and because it 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 really can represent for the KM team, um, and and it helps it helps um, start to build kind of a um, comprehensive understanding of what knowledge management is inside our organizations beyond just a repository or a community of practice or whatever we have in place, right? And what we've um, what we've seen in a lot of organizations over the years is uh, their their brands actually uh, can be very enduring. The 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 image might change just a little. They may they may change the um, the graphic here just a little bit, but they you know where the the US USPOA says where knowledge thrives. Um, that is a very can be a very enduring brand, and we've seen others. Um, uh, the Federal Reserve and how they became um, the knowledge bank. And that was that was their brand is that they're the knowledge bank for all things monetarily related um, uh, and um, others like um, Shell with ask, learn, share, you know, and so they were using theirs to help drive certain behaviors uh, inside the organization. And they, they built a, um, a, a whole kind of um, uh, their, their whole knowledge sharing culture around that those three simple words, ask, learn, share. So, you know. I would encourage um, for those of you who uh, are thinking about this or, or um, maybe just because of the conversation we're having now or just starting to think about it, but uh, you know, uh, give us some critical thought. Don't, um, don't, uh, uh, go, no, don't necessarily take the easy path or the easy route with it because this is something that you want to endure. Uh, you want it to be representative of uh, your KM program um, and uh, you want it also to be, again, something that is crisp, that is clear, that is easy for people to internalize and begin to understand that doesn't require a 50 page presentation behind it to explain what we're trying to get at. Absolutely. I think that the brand is one of those aspects that not enough people pay enough attention to early enough. It's, I agree. So one other aspect of engagement that we wanted to highlight is the need to proactively manage change. And you have to look at that holistically in terms of supporting structures, communication, buy-in, training, leadership, rewards and recognition. And uh, APQC has done a, a deep dive on all of those. Um, uh, we've talked about it a lot. I'm not going to belabor it here. But I did want to share this example from Prudential's change management strategy, which functions as a feedback loop. So KM started by identifying target audiences, executives, managers, frontline employees, 
and then worked with each audience to understand what their change impacts were going to be, and they developed a, a targeted change strategy for each. And then as KM rolled out the change management strategy, it was constantly collecting data and feedback that, that it used to tweak it and reassess that strategy. And then in the second year of the KM implementation, they further refined the change strategy to focus more on certain elements like leadership engagement and the end user experience. So I don't think we need to get too far into the weeds with this here, but I love how customized Prudential's approach is and also how agile and responsive it is over time. Change management really cannot be a chain, check the box exercise where you communicate, you train, you forget about it. You have to constantly look at what's not working and circle back to address those challenges, those barriers to knowledge sharing. That's what a good change management strategy really does. And, and Lauren, if I can just jump in here, I, I wanna go back to what uh, a comment you made earlier at the beginning when you said, you know, our, our plans rarely survive the first encounter um, uh, uh, with the enemy. Um, of course, we don't, our, we don't consider our end users enemies here, but they rarely, um, or, or, or they, they, it's not that they don't survive, but it's when they hit reality is when we realize, oh, that we forgot, there's something we forgot and we need to add it into our plan or we have to adjust the timelines a little bit. And so just like with your, your strategy, the same thing is, is uh, that applies also with your change management plans. Um, because there, there will be something's going to happen um, and when reality and, and rubber hits the road and you, you are going to have to make adjustments. So just be prepared for that and, and be flexible and agile um, uh, in your thinking and your approach to it. And the, the last section that I want to talk about is this progression, how you assess and build and scale over time. And we're not going to spend a ton of time on it because I think that it really echoes a lot of the themes that we've talked about, these iterative processes and feedback loops throughout the webinar. But there's just a, a couple of things that I want to touch on. And the first is um, the importance of measurement, especially at the early stages. Um, you know, some organizations think, oh, well, I'm going to start doing things and then I'll start measuring. But measurement is really how you prove out the business case so you can get that continued funding and support, um, kind of the, making that business case that Darcy was talking about in terms of, of getting resources. And it's also how you diagnose problems. So um, you'll see those both of those in uh, this example from Swagelock, which is uh, at least the top half of this pyramid is how their communities of practice are measured. Um, so the top of the pyramid, you have those business results. Each community has unique business objectives and the KM team looks at whether those are being met and also communicates that data to leadership. So that's kind of the value piece. But then under that pinnacle are metrics that are standardized across communities, whether members are engaged, whether they're happy with the community, whether they have ready access to critical knowledge. And that data, that's kind of the operational data that's useful for evaluating the health of the community and where maybe some interventions or improvements might be necessary. And, and both of those help with the progression, both the value metrics and more of those health or operational metrics. So I think it's important to get a balance of both. And then the final thing is just scaling and improving based on what works. And I think we've talked about that several times today. Um, measurement helps you do that because it helps you figure out what's good, what's bad, what should we do more of and, and build, you know, this community is great, let's build five more of them. This system isn't working so well, maybe we'll take that back to the drawing board. All three of the organizations that we studied really excelled at adopting, you know, an agile iterative approach where they would do a little bit and then they would test it, they would um, you know, assess, collect feedback before they go any further. And the world is moving away from these big waterfall projects where you go off for two years and come back and present your perfect solution. And KM is no different. It's better to put something out there, test it in the real world as soon as you can, and then adjust as you go along. Yeah, absolutely. That's That's um, been a growing trend. Um, Lauren, for, for years now, and, and these three organizations exemplify it, is doing those pilots. 
um, you know, and and you know, you may you may test with more than one group, the same the same technology or the same process, knowledge sharing process or or our CAME approach. You know, you may test uh, with an engineering group and with a sales group, and then what works best in both and adjust and then take it to a third, you know, so if you, you, there's different ways to go about doing it, but I think, you know, the successful, the, the, the programs that we've talked to, including these three that have, have really seen success over the years, they all have piloted um, and they all um, advocate for, for piloting rather than that kind of waterfall or, or big bang approach, you know, where you're just like, we're just gonna roll it all out all at once, um, you know, and it's going to be end to end and beautiful uh, because it just it, it's very rare that it that it works perfectly in the way. So uh, the way that we um, idealized it in in our minds. So, uh, you know, I think that um, these smaller approaches um, and with, or these these pilots as we do them, they also the other thing they help us do is continue to build those relationships and really get in. Um, uh, on the ground floor with these um, audiences, these different audiences that we're supporting to, un to, to continue to further build our understanding of what they need and refine from there. Um, and and it's, it's a really beautiful thing when it works the way it's supposed to. Absolutely. Well, those are our recommendations. We are going to leave it there for today. If you want to learn more about everything we talked about, we have a white paper. You can check out the executive summary, infographic, and also detailed case studies of the three organizations that we featured in the webinar today. And we also want to let you know about some events that we have coming up. We are planning, um, at least as much as anything can be planned, an in-person uh, conference uh, for our, our knowledge and process audiences for October of this year. And I want to let you all know that the call for speakers for that is currently open. So if you think that you'd be interested in presenting, um, please uh, click the learn more, or go, come to our website, or you can, can message me and I'll be happy to give you some more information about that. We've got some virtual roundtables coming up uh, on some some hot topics for km so please keep an eye out for that as well as obviously our monthly webinars so i know that we've got a few minutes left i don't know if we've got any questions that have come in darcy if you've seen any that we should address in our last few minutes here um there yeah so there's one from there's one from Alice and Alice asks is, um, she's asking if there's a sample template for a brand new process. She says her organization hasn't paid any mind to KM. Um, so we'd be, they'd be starting from ground zero or below. Um, so Lauren, I was thinking about our KM Essentials collection on, on strategy. Yeah, we have some really good resources for getting started on different topics, both introduction to knowledge management, identifying critical knowledge, um, transferring critical knowledge, knowledge mapping. Um, I think we've got one on the governance framework that has things like communications templates and measurement templates in it and stuff like that. So I think there's a lot of good foundational resources, but looking for the KM Essentials is a, is a great one. Um, you know, but but um, I think wh whatever specific point you're at, I'm happy to um, give anyone some personal recommendations if they're looking for something specific as well. Because um, I know sometimes uh, going to the resource library can be a bit of bit overwhelming if you're not sure exactly what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. It, it can be. Even for those of us who don't know exactly what we're looking for, there's a, we just have so many came, awesome came resources available in there. Um, so. Quickly, um, we have another um, question, and um, this one um, is from Sonia, and she's asking, um, you know, where do you draw the line between knowledge management and learning and development? Oh, it's such a consulting answer, right? It depends. Um, you know, I mean, some organizations have knowledge management as a group within their learning and development function. Um, I think that can work really well for certain things. It gives you a cohesive user experience because users don't care whether it's a learning resource or a knowledge resource. They just want the information, um, you know, whether it's an online course or a how-to document or a wiki page. Um, I, I think the only challenge with that is that there are things that knowledge management does that might not be in the normal purview of learning and development. 
um, you know, around more of the collaboration piece or documenting critical knowledge, you know, learning tends to be focused on the individual, um, you know, whereas there's some functions of, of knowledge management that are really about protecting knowledge at the organizational level rather than delivering it to individual people for their learning and development. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I think that there, there's pros and cons, but it's a, it's a Venn diagram with a lot of overlap, but it's important to recognize that there are some things included in knowledge management that might not be in your traditional learning and development uh, purview. Absolutely. And, but when the two partner together, it is so incredibly powerful. And, and we actually have, of course, some resources in um, the resource library that, that talk about knowledge management, partnering with L&D, with training, and um, some of the uh, examples and approaches that we've seen work at, at, at different organizations. So. That and I thought we've got one question here around uh, KM Champion programs embedded yes. in the business. I don't know mm -hmm. if we have time to deal with that right now, but we've got some great resources on that. So I'll try to include a, a link in the follow-up message for the webinar um, to some of our, our good, very good research on how you build those KM Champions in the business. So I know we are at time. I want to mm -hmm. thank everyone so much for joining us and for asking questions and, and uh, hanging out with us for an hour today. And I hope that I will see all of you uh, next month for April's webinar. So thanks so much, Darcy, for hanging out with me. And uh, it's a great conversation around uh, getting your KM program from strategy to reality. I had so much fun. Thanks for inviting me, Lauren. All right, Thank take you, care. Everybody. Hope to see everyone next week. And please submit yes. for the conference if you're interested. Absolutely. Absolutely. Bye, everyone. Bye.